Uh, so I, I guess we can get started here. Um, this is uh, Docker as a replacement for virtual environment. Uh, but that's just a title. Uh, really, I'm here to convince you to not use any of those tools that are up there and to use Docker for your environments in Python. Um, I'm David Felix. Uh, you can find me at David J. Felix on Twitter, GitHub, probably everywhere else. Um, I've been using Python for nine years. I actually learned it on stage at a Pi Ohio uh, somewhere around campus. I don't actually know where it was. Um, and I'm a platform engineer at Kroger Digital. Uh, there's a lot of us. We're in Cincinnati, Ohio, or Blue Ash. Uh, lots of fast moving teams. Um, lots of interesting tech, including Docker. There's a little bit of Python. Uh, and we're hiring. So come talk to me. Um, so right now, for environment management, uh, there are a lot of ways to do it. Um, there's a little asterisk at the bottom. I haven't used a couple of these. And I hope not a whole lot of people have manually managed their environment for an extended period of time past like you know, just using PIP uh, on the system level. There's also PyENV, um, which is different from PyVENV, which is VEMV in 3.3. Uh, I actually have never used that. I started using Docker before that. Um, virtual env, Vagrant, uh, and Vagrant has a number of backends. Uh, but I'm here to talk about Docker because last year when I was up here, um, I was presenting about async IO, and 100% of the questions that I got were about my Docker setup. So I figured that might be worth talking about. So virtual env, why, why are people using it in the first place? Hopefully you're using something to manage your environments. Like I said, manual is sad face. Um, well, Python likes to put all of its modules uh, very close to its interpreter. Not necessarily next to it, but um, they all end up in one place unless you manage your environments for that. Um, by using virtual environments, you can, you can isolate them from both your operating system, which likes to have its own version of things. Um, you can also separate them from other applications that you have out there. So you can keep you know, this version for this application because that's what you tested it with, and this version for another. Hopefully they don't trail off too much, but things happen, especially in production. Um, and keeping that, that isolation uh, really helps you ensure that things are going to run the way that you expect them to every time. And that's a big theme that I want to stick with, is that if it's not running the way that you expect it to, it's, it's not immutable. It's, it's mutable, and handling your environments in an immutable manner um, is what virtualization and virtual env is all about. So. Um, Obviously, I wouldn't be pitching another solution unless there were some shortcomings or, or um, deficiencies. Um, virtual env, pyenv, venv, and manual are all uh, dependent on the host OS. So with, um, with like OSX, you're going to have a slightly different setup. It's not going to be very different because Python is, is fortunately cross-platform. But um, with CPython, you'll end up with um, differences in the C modules. Uh, again, hopefully that's not a lot, but library availability will, will definitely be a factor if you run into something like PyODBC, um, where you need the, the backing library for it. Or if you're tying into um, something that compiles slightly differently on, um, on Windows or OS X than it does on Linux. Um, the availability of libraries are, is, is going to have a big factor on how your modules get brought in. Um, it's a lot of stuff that you don't generally want to think about in Python. Uh, a lot of people will encourage like, you know, to, to bring in modules that are entirely Python because it avoids all this nonsense that we're we don't want to deal with. Um, one, another big thing is that there's a lack of unified tooling with these. So like, getting from nothing to having your virtual environment set up um, tends to be a little bit of tribal wisdom. Uh, you know, you bring in your requirements file, and hopefully that has everything. But if your system requires something, you kind of have to have a bash script or you have to have a CMD. And that's all going to be platform specific. Um, but the biggest one that I don't like is that it's mutable. So uh, what that actually means is if, if I were to go into my virtual environment, I can change it at any time. Uh, so if, if I'm working on my virtual environment and someone else says, oh, I like this one. I'm going to continue using this because my app uses all the same dependencies. And they update it, that affects me. And that's, that's not good behavior, but I haven't done anything to stop it. So 
uh, what can I really say about it besides don't do that, man, you know? Um, <laughs> so I, I'd like to pitch a, a way to solve some of those things. Um, if you've used VMs, that solves a lot of it. Uh, you get the whole image down. Um, the problem is that they're very heavy. I, I actually used Vagrant for a while. Uh, I really liked Vagrant. I've shared Vagrant files with people, uh, shared virtual boxes, uh, virtual boxes through Vagrant with people. Um, but it, it is really expensive. Uh, I think the image that I was sharing was about two gigabytes. Um, it was an entire Ubuntu image. It had everything. And it was just running Ubuntu in OS X or running Ubuntu in Windows. Um, it was pretty expensive to orchestrate. If you had two of them, now you have four gigabytes. And it, it was pretty colossal. Um, but it kept everything sane, uh, aside from the massive use of resources. Um, again, very good for immutability. And Vagrant is still pretty nice, even with the Docker backend. So I'd encourage you to look at Vagrant if that sounds interesting. But I actually want to introduce Docker, which can be used as a backend for it, or it can be used independently, as I'm going to show you here. Um, Docker uses a different type of virtualization called containers. Uh, this has been made famous probably by uh, Google's very secretive Borg platform, um, which they consider to be like their secret weapon for moving their application around on different servers. Um, it's, it's similar to chroot or BSD jails. Uh, in how you isolate processes within an operating system. Um, it doesn't use a whole uh, operating system virtualized on the processor level. It's actually using libraries that are available to the operating system to virtualize access within the operating system. Um, a big thing for me, though, is I work in a not only Python environment. It's, um, we have Java. We have uh, JavaScript, we have Python, we have Clojure. So having it not just be Python is actually a really big benefit. Um, and I think that shows in the community, uh, which I'll show you in a, in a bit. Um, the big thing about containers, though, is that where I had a two gigabyte VM, uh, now I only have the libraries that are necessary. So I can base it off of an Ubuntu image, but I only have 600 megs of essential libraries. And that's like a little bit overboard in terms of essential. Like I have Bash, and I have, uh, I have the C library that comes with that version of Ubuntu. So the essential portion of that is still rather unessential. Um, but any of the libraries that you need can be packed into that container and shipped that way. So it's not a tribal wisdom of here's how you install this. Here's how you turn on the virtual environment. It's here's the image, and it runs. I've already set it up for you. Um, the Docker runtime takes care of all that. And what's really interesting is you can do that remote or local. So a lot of the early workflows when people sit down and try Docker the first time, they log in on their own console, and they're running Docker locally. But in reality, it's a, it's a TCP command line that's just talking to their local machine. You could route that to a remote machine and say, go get this image, run it. So that provides a lot of potential for orchestrating these containers in the future. Um, it's not necessarily something you want to think about early on, but having this high ceiling means that you have this, this full ecosystem and full set of utilities that really help you take a virtual environment from just here's how to make it not break to here's how we run it stably uh, and reliably and continue this idea of like our ops is all in code. So um, I, t I tend to think that Docker heavily favors immutability. Um, everything in the way that Docker operates tends to work in a uh, forward only motion. And um, it actually, on the back end, uses a copy on write file system where uh, any changes are actually moving forward, so you can version it backwards uh, and work with that. So uh, I'm going to pray to the demo gods here, and we're going to try uh, to show it off a little bit. If I can find my mouse, it's on that screen. Now it's on, what screen is it on? Yeah, I know, but uh, all right. 
Okay. Can everybody read this huge font? Is that big enough for everybody? Okay. Um, so I have Docker running locally, um, and we're gonna we're gonna issue a couple commands here. So um, one of the neat things about Docker is that it's got it's got uh, community contributed um, uh, Docker files. So a Docker file is essentially a, a recipe for setting up an environment. Uh, what we're looking at right here is the official repository made by the Docker uh, employees for Python. And you'll see there are a number of different tags. So we have every version under the sun of 2.7. Uh, we have 3.3, 3.4, 3.5, 3.6 alpha. Uh, and then we have variants on top of those. So the default one is, is based off of Debian Jesse. Um, it's going to be similar in user experience to like a, a, an Ubuntu image. Um, but with Slim, it's significantly smaller. It's, instead of 600 megabytes, we trim down all the libraries that aren't essential and get to just usable libraries. And we end up with about 100 megabytes. Um, Alpine is even smaller at 18. Uh, and I, there, there are a couple other differences. Um, in general, you want to start out with a, a just normal one and then start trimming it down as space becomes a problem. I, it's a couple megabytes here or there. So, what I, I did is um, I actually pulled down uh, a couple of these because I don't trust the network. Uh, I would normally do something like Docker pull, Python, and then the tag. So I don't believe in Python 2.7 anymore. So I would do this. And normally, it would download all of the layers of that image. I already have it. So I can just, um, I can just move forward with that. So um, Normally, when you're working with this, uh, you would have a Docker file in your, uh, in your source. I'll show you that in a second. But um, that Docker file would say how to move your source into the container and how to run it independent of you. Uh, right now, I'm going to show you the inside of the container and, and give you an idea of what it actually looks like. Um, so we're inside of a Docker container right now. Um, I'm this is, this is a MacBook. It's running OS X. Uh, and it thinks it's on Linux. Um, so I can you know, print, right? Isn't that nice? Um, but more importantly, I actually get a lot of utilities there. So if instead of just running the container with its default action, which is Python, because that's what it's set up for, I can actually get a bash shell inside of there. and deal with a lot of the, the background tasks that you would want in an environment. So um, if, say, I need to move files around, or I have, I have JavaScript that needs to be compiled or transpiled and packed um, before I start serving it, I can do all of that as part of the build process on my container uh, because I have utilities like Bash available in the container. And then I can slim it down pack it out to uh, a repository, and any Docker runtime can pull it down and run it as I published it. So um, now I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you what, um, what a Docker file uh, looks like. So let's look at the, oh boy, I lost it, 3.5. So. Um, Here's the, the, I mean, this is the source for a Docker file. And it's, it's pretty simple. But um, the way that it works is that it builds in layers. So this from command says that this is a new layer on top of something else someone has done. So there's another container out there called build pack depths Jesse. So this is going to be a Debian Jesse image that has all of the stuff that I need to build my, my project. Um, it's going to run app get and clean up all of the Python stuff, right? Uh, and then it's going to do everything that if you were to, to try to install Python from source, you would have to do. Um, and it's going to leave you with a nice little command here that says, run Python 3 as a default command. Uh, so when I try to use that, that container, that's what it's going to try to do. And it'll give me the, the prompt. Um, but if I wanted to say, uh, let me get out of here. So I'm in the container right now, leaving the container back in my pretty prompt, right? Um, uh, doo, doo, doo. Oh, come on. Okay. 
Um, so let's say I have a Flask app, and I oh, shoot, sorry. Uh, let's so I have a Flask app, and um, that's all I need to run it. So uh, I have this I have this from Python 3.5 Slim. I don't need the full size one. I'm not using a whole lot of operating system utilities. Uh, this will bring me down. Python and then like a little bit of, of operating system um, convenience like Bash. It'll bring me down libc. It'll bring me down everything that I need to build modules. It'll bring me pip. But nothing too heavy like all of Jesse would bring, which is just like, you know, it'll bring over the proc fi file system and stuff like that. So I set the working directory to, uh, to opt because that's where I like to put things. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I copy my requirements file over from the source on my box that I'm building this on, um, and then I install those requirements. So that, that would be like if I was manually installing them, but I'm not manually installing them. I'm installing them into the Docker machine, or into the Docker um, container, and then I'm providing that container for uh, everyone else to run exactly how I've done it. And they don't have to compile it. They just pull it down, already built. So any modules that I build here, if I have C extensions that I need to bring in GCC for, and then remove GCC for, all of that gets done and gets turned into just a file that they download. Um, so then I copy. Uh, this, this can all be done as one step. I could copy both of these at the same time. Uh, I do it this way because the way that Docker works is that it can detect when file system changes are going to affect it. And it will rebuild from the step that it needs to. Um, so I copy my source after my dependencies because I feel like my source changes more than my dependencies. So that just means that when. Um, my whenever my requirements file uh, happens to change, I'm actually going to rebuild everything after that. Um, I'm exposing port 5000, since that's the default Flask port. Uh, and I'll show you how to map that. Uh, but then I'm setting up the, the command so that it's Python and run my hello pi. So let's, let's take a look at um, hello pi. Simple Flask app, nothing too special. Um, but if I wanted to run it, uh, one of the nice things is that Docker not only provides this file system isolation and process isolation, it's actually providing a network isolation too. So these processes, um, by default, nothing can get into them. There's, there's no in and out of, of network traffic. There's nothing that I don't ask it for. So when I ask it for 5,000, when I do Docker run, uh, I need to pay attention to one of these screens, not both of them. Um, I can do this. Uh, sorry, it trails off a little bit there. Um, let me actually do that. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm telling it here is this dash P is a, a port mapping. So I want it, the local host port to map to the container port. And that'll actually occupy the port as if it was running on my machine. Uh, but I'm explicitly telling Docker, that traffic is perfectly fine for it. Um, anything on that port, TCP or UDP, will go in, um, but only because I've told it to do that. Uh, one of the nice things that Docker provides is that it can do virtualized networks between containers. So say I have uh, a Node.js app talking to a Python API, uh, and I want them to explicitly talk to each other, but I don't want any funny business with it talking out anywhere else. I can explicitly set up that network, and no other containers that people deploy on that host are going to interfere with that. They're directly linked to each other. And that network is actually becoming part of our environment. So that's something that virtual and just can't do, uh, not without a significant amount of overhead with IP tables um, and a lot of utilities that, frankly, I, I didn't have the time to learn. Um, I think I'm just about out of time here. So I'll open it up for questions. Uh,